And now we kindly invite Mr. Dennis Crowley, representing the European Commission, Director General for Education and Culture. He's currently uh, the head of unit with responsibility for the Marie Skladowska Curie Actions for Research and Mobility, also the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, and for Policy on Innovation in Education. And Mr. Crowley's presentation is about innovation and education, learning, teaching, and building partnerships in the digital age. All of that. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I really want to sincerely thank the, uh, the, the, our hosts in the university and, uh, and Eden. And I'll be saying a little bit more as I come back into my speech about the importance of events like this and the importance of, of an organisation, an intermediary body such as Eden, without which the things that I'm going, the aspirations that I'm going to set out for the European Commission just, just would not happen, would not work. Um, our theme is, is collaboration, collaboration around the world of open and quality education that you evoked in your introductory remarks. And um, I want to set a little bit, start by setting the context for why the European Commission is interested in these issues, because I think it's worth, it's worth uh, recalling. Um, let me in indulge myself because my training is, is, is as a historian, so let me tell you a little bit of history. And it's history that I guess you'll be familiar with. It's about, it's, it's about the story of how the European Union fell into the business of education, in particular with the, with, with the Erasmus programme. The Erasmus programme, which was de de designed more than 20 years ago, as, as to be something relatively simple, but with a very simple insight, very simple but important insight, that it is, it is a valuable thing to, to the education of young Europeans that they be given a European dimension to that education. So the very first initial thought behind the, the, the Erasmus program was that we should circulate young people as part of their education, and in the process we will make them a little bit more European. In fact, what Erasmus has grown, we've grown to see that Erasmus does a lot more than that. Erasmus is a first evocation of the idea of circulation of, 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 of young people of brains and, 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 um, and uh, uh, using this as a means to break down barriers between systems. And with the circulation of individuals, very quickly it became to be seen that this was also a mechanism for circulating ideas. Um, uh, ideas uh, uh, between, between systems which heretofore had been locked into very national patterns uh, um, of, of thinking. Now, uh, we're very clear on this, but after Erasmus, there came the Bologna process, uh, a mechanism which approached the same issue of breaking down barriers between systems, but approached it from the level of systems. In other words, we had uh, individuals moving around and talking to one another, but there were barriers to the degree to which they could talk to one another, which were at the system level. So it was a question of breaking down barriers between systems. So we have Bologna, Bologna which has <coughs> achieved some things, not achieved in other areas, but at least we now understand each other's degree structures better. At least we have uh, reasonably good, but not perfect, uh, recognition of qualifications gained abroad. We have made it much more possible for, uh, for the individuals, but also for the systems to understand and exchange uh, between uh, themselves. Side by side with all of that, there came a revelation. European policy making at Brussels concerns areas where the European Union has been given formal powers in the areas such as the single market, in environmental policy, in other areas, but not in education. There is no European education policy, and there will not be. Uh, there is not going to be a single European education policy of any sort. However, it seems clear that the more you expand the areas in which Brussels makes important policy decisions which affect on national policies, on regional policies, so the more you bring in uh, joint policy making around, for example, public spending issues, which very much came to the fore during the 90s and later with the creation of the common currency, and we've seen how important it is in recent years and all through the summer, where the question of how Greece makes its decides on its public spending became such a huge European issue for all of us. The more you do that, the more it is clear that education spending issues, education quality of education issues, education investments are part of the European policy scene. And that the European policy scene 
is an important factor in setting the limits and the capacities of education policymakers to make their policy. So it is important that the voice of education policy should be raised in Brussels. If not, then the policy making that goes on in those other areas where Europe has firm competence, that policy making is going to be incomplete and that policy making is going to be imperfect and it risks to damage education, the capacity of education uh, ministries, of education actors to, to create good policy making. So it is important, even if there is never going to be, and I stress this, a European education policy, it is important that education voices are heard in Brussels. So from the initial insight of the programmes, which brought people together, uh, there has grown up policy exchanges, purely voluntary, between the Commission and Member States around what constitutes good education, around what Europe can do to facilitate and support good education, and, uh, and, and, and uh, it, it, around ensuring that those policies that are made at Brussels uh, should be supportive of that. Now, I don't know that we've always succeeded in that respect. If you talk to your colleagues from, from Greece about how it has been over the last number of years, they will refer to the problems and they will refer to, to Brussels as being not part of the solution to their problems, but as part of the, of, of the source of their problems. So, you know, this is, this is why it is important that we have dialogues with member states and policy makers about, about education issues, but also that we have the voices of educators being heard at the European level. And in this context, we come to the set of issues which we group together under the banners of open education and innovation in education. And why are these important for us? Well, it is clear that uh, we need to prepare young Europeans for a world that in itself is open, where innovation, ICTs, uh, and other such, such, such developments are going to be hugely important drivers of the lives that those young Europeans will lead. Hugely important components of the jobs that they will have, hugely important drivers of growth, hugely important drivers of constant change in the, in, in the economies, in, in social life, and hopefully also hugely important sources of the solutions to the problems that we are facing, to, to demographic ageing, to, to, to uh, environmental crises, um, and a hugely important determinant of the fact that what people will have to be for the future is lifelong learners. The world that we are looking at for the future is clearly one in which people, regions, countries will thrive if they're based on lifelong learning. So we know that. The other reason why we're interested in, in open um, education is for what it can do for education itself. So education must be at the service of the world, preparing people for the world which is out there, but open resources can also be at the service of good education. Now, those are the two dimensions of our, our, our interest, and those are dimensions which I know will be evoked during today. In all this, the other part of our, our, our title for this event is collaboration. So why collaboration and what types of collaboration? Well, why collaboration? Because the changes, the pressures, the demands, the new technologies, the opportunities that are driving the world that I've described are not coming at us singly. They're coming, they're hitting us all. We face these challenges together in all our different levels and in all the different educational sectors that are represented here today. And the other thing that we know, and this is very clear, is that education actors who are interested and who are actively embracing new approaches, new technologies in the classroom, in their systems, are working in isolation, somewhat. I mean, it's very uneven. The uptake of, of, of technologies in classroom is very uneven across Europe. Um, the degree to which teachers feel supported by their school heads, the degree to which school heads feel supported by their regional authorities, the degree to which ministries have an interest in, can do anything about these issues, very uneven. We have um, results from a survey which will show us that among teachers, 
um, teachers who are teaching only 25% of European students, only that group, say they are confident in handling issues around digitalization. At the same time, 70% of the same group of teachers say that they want more training. They would like more guidance on how to do this. So teachers are saying something very, very clear. Um, we know that those demands and that, 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 that cry coming from teachers is not necessarily being heard. It is in some countries being heard better than others. It is in some countries being heard by individuals within ministries. There are champions within ministries of all this, but not necessarily. We don't know to what extent there is a political will behind this or is a political capacity to address these. So, in all of this, collaboration. Collaboration can help hugely. Collaboration across borders, the classic route, the classic area in which Europe can play a role, but not just across borders, um, across the boundary of education with business. Business has huge insights to tell us about, about how they have embraced technologies, but will not be a driver of this change. Let's be clear about this. It's not up to Amazon or Google or Microsoft to tell us the way the education world needs to be developed or to, or to, 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 to change the education world. It's up to the education world to do that. Um, collaboration across education sectors, and I'm, I'm very pleased to note that we have here, as you said, we have representatives of all education sectors here, that is, by the way, in all of the collaboration work that we foster at the European level, that's not something that we see enough of. There isn't enough interaction between vocational training and universities, between preschool education and others. It's not something we see enough of. We're far more comfortable talking within our own groups, edu um, uh, edu um, higher education people to higher education people, for example. So, you know, that's very important. Across subject boundaries, that word, another word that I could have evoked in evoking the word, the future word is interdisciplinarity. The problems that we face don't come in neat academic subject categories. Um, the solutions that we are seeking will come through interdisciplinary work. And so just talking across academic faculties is in itself a form of collaboration that we need to engage in if we're going to face these issues. So that's the collaboration, and that's the world in which we, 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 we want to, uh, to, to focus. What can the EU do? Well, I think I've already touched on that. We can have, and we do have, very agreeable and very comfortable dialogue in smaller rooms than this with representatives of each of the ministries of the 28 uh, uh, member states, at which we talk about, we've had over the last two years, a working group on digital and online learning at which we talk about the challenges that we face. I was happy to learn last night that at least one person in the whole ha has, has heard of this and has seen actually seen a concrete output from that work. But that in itself tells a story. We, as, I, I, as I say, I, I use the word deliberately, we have a very comfortable and very agreeable dialogue with this group of people. We don't know what happens to it. We don't know whether the, 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 the discussions that we have ever leave the walls of ministries and national capitals and even within ministries, we sometimes see that we can talk. The, our colleagues are like the teacher champions that I mentioned earlier. They are champions within ministries who are very happy to engage with their champ fellow champions across borders, but they don't have others to talk about these issues with in their own ministries. So we can have uh, a good dialogue with this group, and we will be putting online very shortly, coming out of that, a set of principles as to what constitutes good uh, good, good governing principles for for for, uh, for open education at all levels, and we think they are useful. And we are told by some member states that these are going to be useful, and they will apply them in their in, in their in their policy development over the next. We can do that, and we will continue to do that. We will have a new group constituted in the new year, uh, working on digital and online skills, and we will carry on that dialogue. We also use our programs particularly Erasmus+, Plus, but don't forget other programs like Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions, other actions under the Research Framework Program, which are there to support collaboration, networking, exchange between actors, primarily aimed at non-governmental actors, below the level or different from the level that I'm talking about, the level of member state collaboration. 
sometimes big, highly structured actions, such as the knowledge alliances, and sometimes very, very decentralized, very localized actions, very low level, or low level, I think, um, uh, the, the, uh, the e-twinning portal. I don't know how many of you among the teachers who are here know about the e-twinning portal. There are now 330,000 teachers online active in the e-twinning. Can I turn something off? No, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, um, active on this. That's, that's, that's a, a degree of outreach which is very rare at the European level. European level, this isolated bubble up there in Brussels. Um, to be able to have a dialogue with 330,000 teachers is unusual and it is valuable. What is more valuable is the fact that we have 330,000 teachers who are collaborating between themselves. That's the point. That's what this is about. We don't know everything that goes on there and we don't need to know everything that goes on there. But I think the point I want to make and I want to finish with is the fact that the dialogue that we have with 28 member states is fine, and the dialogue that teachers and others will have uh, at their level with peers across borders is, is wonderful. What we need is something between the two. We need ideas to flow from one to the other. We need uh, pressure to come from those teachers who are digital champions mm -hmm. towards the people in the systems to make sure that the champions within ministries know that they have support for what they want to pursue. And that, I think, is where a group like Eden comes in, if I may say so. We need intermediary bodies. We in the European Commission cannot engage with teachers directly. It's just not feasible. Um, but we need intermediary groups which are take, capable of taking the ideas Upwards and downwards, if I can put it that way. I don't mean it in any way. Curses eyes upwards or downwards. One is not good and one is not higher than the other. It's to keep the flow of, of, of ideas between the different levels. And that's why events such as this are important. And the work done by groups such as Eden is important to us. Now, that essentially is what I want to say. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate today that... Um, as, as Commission representative, you often fly into these events and do the opening and then fly out again, but I'm staying around for most of today. I want to hear your ideas on everything, including virtual mobility, uh, about which I have mixed feelings myself, but anyway, I'll be, I'll be, I'm open to be influenced. Um, so thank you very much once again for inviting me here. Uh, I should finish by quoting Mao Zedong, not somebody you see often quoted, and let a thousand flowers bloom. I think it's a, a good way to, to, to think about what we're trying to do here. So, good. Thank you.